The P and ID case, part 2, events after the award of 11 billion dollars damages. This is the audio version of the final judgment on the arbitration claim between the Federal Republic of Nigeria and Process and Industrial Developments Limited, P and ID. Judgment date, the 23rd of October 2023. Judgment by, the Honorable Mr. Justice Robin Knowles C.B. Here are some interesting paragraphs from part one of the BG Media's audio of the final judgment by the Honorable Mr. Justice Robin Knowles. 28. P and ID pointed to what it said was evidence of what it termed catastrophic incompetence, both individual and institutional, that was all pervasive. This it said was the hallmark of Nigeria's handling of at least, I, the GSPA2, all other advanced gas development project, contracts, 3, the arbitration, and, 4, the initial stages of these proceedings. Bribing Mrs. Grace Tiger, the GSBA. 166. It will be recalled that on the 24th of January 2008 P and ID wrote to an NPC to apply on behalf of Tita Kuru for that project to be included in Nigeria's gas master plan. The investors' road show for the gas master plan was on the 5th of May 2008. 167. A week after the investors' road show, on or around the 12th of May 2008 Mrs. Grace Tiger received 1,372 euros by Western Union transfer. On the 28th of October 2008 a payment of 3,500 was made to her, described as Grace Tiger, PR. Her daughter Vera received 5,856 US dollars and 87 cents on the 30th of October 2008 and 6,995 US dollars and 91 cents on the 1st of December 2008, each from Marsh Pearl. 207. Mr. Andrew and Mr. Burke Casey, among others, have very significant personal interests in this matter. They may have a claim to what were described by Mr. Howard Casey as life-changing sums of money, contingent upon success for P and ID in this matter. The figures are up to 850 million in the case of Mr. Burke Casey, and up to 3 billion in the case of Mr. Andrew. Each gave written and oral evidence at the trial. Mr. Andrew tried his best to answer questions carefully and accurately. Mr. Burke Casey gave answers in a way that appeared businesslike and direct at first, but became increasingly exercised as he was taken through more documents. 208. The then Attorney General, Mr. Mohamed Adok San selected Mr. Alasupo Shasor San, to represent Nigeria as leading counsel. This selection was in preference to a recommendation of a Mr. Iziaku San that Mr. Ibrahim Diko, by then legal director at the Ministry of Petroleum Resources, the position that Mrs. Grace Tiger had once held, had made to the Attorney General, a recommendation, that had been endorsed by the Permanent Secretary. Also appointed were 20 Marina Solicitors LLP, a Nigerian law firm with which Mr. Shasor San was associated. 210. I have reviewed these internal documents and at least some were plainly subject to legal professional privilege, they were confidential to Nigeria, and P and ID was not entitled to see them. The more relevant are identified in the course of this judgment. Another was the subject of a separate application in the course of the hearing before me, and privilege in it was not waived by Nigeria. That particular document is not ultimately material to the determination of any of the issues in the case and I do not refer to it further in this judgment. 211. I shall refer to these internal legal documents in the balance of this judgment as Nigeria's internal legal documents. Some of them are said to have been forwarded by individuals named Mr. Sahida Kanji, Mr. Tokenbo James and Mr. Mulero Rachel. Both Nigeria and P and ID say that individuals with these names or aliases are unknown to them. But the transmission of Nigeria's internal legal documents to P and ID, was plainly not the result of incompetence. The scale, nature, 
continuity and destination does not allow that conclusion on any balance of probabilities, even allowing for the seriousness of the conclusion that the transmission was deliberate. 212. Nigeria alleges. P and ID has offered no sensible explanation for why these documents were leaked by, Nigeria's, lawyers and has presented this court with a conspiracy of silence. The obvious and correct inference is that they were obtained through corruption of, Nigeria's, legal advisors carried out by P and ID and Mr. Adebayo, Mr. Murray all but admitted in his oral evidence that, they, were procured by corruption, and no P and ID witness proffered an otherwise honest explanation. 398. 2. It was, respectfully, clear that Nigeria's leading counsel, Chief Aaron San did not understand what the tribunal was putting to him, this is not through any lack of clarity on the part of the tribunal. Leading the case for Nigeria, time and again matters were not put by him to P and ID's experts, with major consequences on key issues as the majority decision shows. The air of unreality is compounded by a statement of fees appearing to bear the signature of Chief Air in San and billing Naira 200 million for quantum of damages hearing and US $197.5 million for negotiation of arbitral award. 3. There does not seem to have been argument, and consideration of argument, whether over 20 years profitability might deteriorate for reasons not concerned with Nigeria's compliance with its obligations, for example a hardening adverse position for gas in the context of a developing global response to climate change. Or, save perhaps at, 395, above, which again contains points of law and fact that Nigeria did not test, note also, 372, above, of the possibility that P and ID might at least in time have devoted profitably elsewhere the time and energies it would otherwise have had to devote here. These might test conventional legal opinion, and be unsuccessful, but they were not attempted where so much turned on it for both parties. Let's start with one of the end notes from the Honorable Mr. Justice Robin Knowles on this P and ID case. 592. This case has also, sadly, brought together a combination of examples of what some individuals will do for money. Driven by greed and prepared to use corruption, giving no thought to what their enrichment would mean in terms of harm for others. Others that in the present case include the people of Nigeria, already let down in so many ways over the history of this matter by a number of individuals in politics and administration whose duty it was to serve them and protect them. Start of Part 2, Events After the Award of $11 Billion Damages, contains paragraphs 406 through to 595. Starting at heading. After the final award. 406. Payments to or to those connected to Mrs. Grace Tiger have continued after the award and include the following. On the 18th of December 2017, Mr. Carhill and Mr. Smith arranged a payment of 10,000 US dollars by Swift from Isil Island into her account. On the 27th of June 2018 another payment of 10,000 US dollars was made in the same way, followed in March 2019 by two payments of 500 euros. All were deliberately concealed from Nigeria. 407. Another without prejudice settlement discussion meeting took place between the parties on 15 and the 16th of May 2017. The effort was unsuccessful and after that, P and ID made clear that they intended to proceed to enforce the final award. On the 27th of October 2017 Mr. Carhill, Lismore, and Process Holdings Limited, a wholly owned subsidiary of the general partner of VR Global Partners LP, entered into an agreement the effect of which was to exchange 25% of the shares and 51% of the voting shares in P and ID in return for an immediate payment of 22.5 million US dollars, and an additional 22.5 million US dollars to fund enforcement of the final award. 408. On the 16th of March 2018, P&ID issued its application for an order from the English Commercial Court to enforce the final award. P&ID also filed a petition for permission to enforce in the USA. Nigeria took the position that the seat of the arbitration was Nigeria, 
where the Nigerian High Court had set aside the award on liability, and that the size of the final award was excessive and contrary to public policy. 409. On 26 June 2018, President Buhari of Nigeria directed Mr. Malami San to reopen settlement negotiations with P&ID. On 12 and 13 July 2018 a further settlement negotiation was attended by Nigeria and P&ID's council but failed. President Buhari also directed Mr. Malami San to conduct an investigation into P&ID, the circumstances surrounding the GSBA, and subsequent events. By this point Mr. Malami had himself been involved, since late 2015, and for most of the quantum stage of the arbitration. On the 28th of June 2018, Mr. Malami San, directed the EFCC to commence a thorough investigation of the GSBA. 410. On the 12th of October 2018, Nigeria applied to the English Commercial Court for relief from sanctions on filing an acknowledgement of service to contest the Nigeria's enforcement application under Section 66 of the Arbitration Act 1996. On the 21st of December 2018, Brian J. granted Nigeria's application for relief from sanctions and gave directions for hearing the enforcement application. 411. In a judgment dated 16 August 2019, Butcher J. found that the seat of the arbitration was England. On 26 September 2019, following a contested hearing, Butcher J. made an order on the enforcement application allowing P and ID to enforce the final award but granting Nigeria permission to appeal on certain grounds. He ordered a stay of enforcement until the determination of the appeal, subject to conditions, which were met. 412. On 3 September 2019, Mrs. Grace Tiger attended an interview at the FCC headquarters, where she was detained in custody. Mr. Nolan was also questioned. On 4 September 2019, the Ministry of Lands and Urban Development confirmed that P&ID was offered land, but never acquired it because they had not paid the prescribed fee. The Infrastructure Concession Regulatory Commission confirmed to the Force Intelligence Bureau, FIB, that the GSBA was not submitted to the Commission for Review and Compliance Certification. On 5 September 2019, Mr. Kuktsi was detained by the EFCC and questioned over his role in the signing of the GSBA. Between 4 and 13 September 2019, Mr. Tijani gave various statements to the EFCC. On 14 September 2019, Mr. Adebayo was interviewed by the EFCC and provided a statement. 413. On 17 and 19 September 2019 Mrs. Grace Tiger, Mr. Kuktsi, Mr. Carhill, and P&ID were charged with a number of offenses under Nigerian law, including corrupt practices and intent to defraud. On the same day 19 September 2019, P&ID was convicted by the Nigerian High Court of various offenses relating to tax evasion, money laundering, and trading without necessary licenses. 414. On the 20th of September 2019, Mrs. Grace Tiger was arraigned. She pleaded not guilty to the charges brought against her and was remanded to prison. On the 16th of October 2019, an accountant at ISIL Nigeria and Imperial JV Limited was interviewed by EFCC. On the 21st of October 2019, Mr. Nolan pleaded not guilty to 16 charges related to allegations of money laundering. On 6 November 2019, a criminal trial against Mrs. Grace Tiger commenced and adjourned. On 20 November 2019, Mr. Nolan and Mr. Adam Quinn were rearranged with 16 charges for a number of offenses under Nigerian law, including money laundering. On 5 December 2019, Mr. Tijani wrote to the FCC, copying Mr. Malami San, referred to P&ID's application to enforce the awards, and promised to support and assist in the investigation and unraveling of the identity slash origin of funds as the need might arise in the course of investigation by the EFCC on condition that he would not be prosecuted. On 18 December 2019, 
The Federal High Court in Abuja granted an application by the EFCC to extradite Mr. Adam Quinn on 25 counts, including money laundering. 415. Meanwhile, on 5 December 2019, Nigeria issued its application for an order from the English Commercial Court to set aside the awards, and the award on jurisdiction, under sections 67-68 of the Arbitration Act 1996 on the grounds that they were procured by fraud and or other conduct that is contrary to public policy, and that the tribunal lacked jurisdiction. 416. Section 73 of the 1996 Act provides for a 28-day time limit from the date of award, or notification of the outcome of any arbitral process of appeal or review, for challenges under sections 67 and 68, and so an extension of time was sought by Nigeria. An application was issued to adduce new evidence and rely on fresh grounds. Relief from sanctions was sought for this application. On 24 January 2020, Butcher J ordered that Nigeria's applications for an extension of time for its application to set aside the awards, and the award on jurisdiction, and for relief from sanctions be heard first. On 29 January 2020 Flork LJ ordered that the appeal from Butcher J's decision on the application to enforce the awards be stayed pending the determination of Nigeria's applications, for the extension of time and relief from sanctions. 417. In the USA, on 26 March 2020, Nigeria applied to the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York under Section 1782 of Title 28 of the United States Code to obtain discovery of bank accounts at 10 different banks. Discovery orders were made on 7 May 2020. Documents disclosed pursuant to these orders showed the payments from Marsh Pearl and Chrisom to Mrs. Grace Tiger's daughter Vera of $4,969.50 on 30 December 2009 and $5,000 on 31 January 2012. 418. The hearing, before Sir Ross Cranston, of the applications for an extension of time and relief from sanctions, took place over 13 and the 14th of July 2020. In a reserved judgment of the 4th of September 2020, Sir Ross granted Nigeria an extension of time to pursue the application to set aside, and relief from sanctions to rely on new evidence to resist the application to enforce. He found that there was a strong prima facie case that the awards were procured by fraud. 419. Nigeria notes that for those applications there was no mention of Nigeria's internal legal documents. These did not come to light until, a year after hearing before Sir Ross and his judgment, when P and ID informed Nigeria by way of a letter dated 29 October 2021 from Mr. Stephen Hayes of Cobre and Kim who were P and ID's then solicitors in these proceedings. Mr. Hayes disclosed that his firm had identified documents over which Nigeria might seek to assert privilege, or which might otherwise be confidential. He was referring to Nigeria's internal legal documents. He advised that a continuing information barrier had been put in place between himself and the Cobre and Kim case team. 420. Following the judgment of Sir Ross, a number of further orders for the disclosure of documents have been made internationally on Nigeria's application. On 8 January 2021, Nigeria applied again to the New York court to obtain discovery of documents held by VR concerning its acquisition of P&ID and the enforcement of the awards. On 24 June 2021, Orders were made in the Cayman Islands for the disclosure of documents by various third parties including Arcadia Group Limited. On the 22nd of October 2021, the District Court of Nicosia made an order for the disclosure of documents against the Bank of Cyprus, and on the 13th of January 2022 an order was made in the British Virgin Islands for disclosure against, among others, Narina Trust Company, BVI, Limited and Trident Trust Company, BVI, Limited, the registered agents of P&ID. 421. 
Between December 2021 and October 2022 Nigeria filed applications with the Commercial Court here in London for further disclosure and related orders, and a notice to prove documents. Various orders were made by a number of judges of the court. Of particular note was an order dated 15 July 2022 made by Jacobs J that P and ID and others provide disclosure of certain WhatsApp slash SMS threads. The attempts to obtain documents that would throw relevant light on the case was not all one way. On 30 September 2022, P&ID itself issued an application seeking disclosure-related relief against Nigeria pursuant to CPR PD51U. The alleged middlemen, Mr. Kuktsi and Mr. Adebayo. 422. Mr. Kuktsi was called as a witness by P&ID. Mr. Adebayo was not. Mr. Kuksi. 423. Mr. Kuksi was associated with Dr. Luckman but he was retained by P and ID, not Nigeria. He witnessed Mr. Michael Quinn's signature to the GSBA, and attended meetings of the JOC on behalf of P and ID. On business cards, he was described as P and ID's commercial director. 424. Payments were made to him by the ISIL group, but those do not take things very far given that he was retained by P and ID not Nigeria. There is sufficient evidence to persuade me that he had some access to some of Nigeria's internal legal documents. 425. Not long after the GSBA was signed, on 19 March 2010 Mr. Michael Quinn sent a letter from P and ID to Core Holdings Limited, a company owned by Mr. Kuktsi, confirming that core holdings were entitled to 3% of the net post-tax profits payable annually and pro rata as the profits were received under the GSBA. Nothing I heard at trial, including from him, satisfied me on the question of what Mr. Kuktsi had done to earn that level of reward. Nigeria alleged that he exercised his influence over officials to procure the conclusion of the GSBA, but I have little to show improper influence. Mr. Adebayo. 426. By early 2012 Mr. Adebayo had also been appointed by P and ID to assist them, including in negotiations with Nigeria. Mr. Adebayo owned GFD Energy, which, as noted above, had entered into its own GSBA with the Ministry of Petroleum Resources on 26 May 2011. Payments were made to him by the ISIL group, but, as with Mr. Kuktsi, those do not take things very far given that he was retained by P and ID, not Nigeria. 427. Nigeria alleged he had a war chest blatantly to be used, to spend on bribes promised in chasing a settlement, and that he paid and promised bribes to officials and lawyers acting for Nigeria. But on the material before me, this was not proved to my satisfaction. On 2 July 2014 P and ID entered a settlement brokerage agreement appointing Mr. Adebayo as a representative in settlement negotiations. The potential rewards were enormous, entitling him to a share of any settlement proceeds up to a maximum, of 50% of any agreed, settlement sum greater than 1 billion US dollars. This seems to have been replaced by an internal advisory agreement in August, 2016 entitling Mr. Adebayo to up to 20% of settlement proceeds. Under a deed of variation to a share sale agreement dated 2017 Castle Knock Holdings Limited, a company beneficially owned by Mr. Carhill, Mr. Andrew, and Mr. Burke KC, promised to pay 10% of the distributions received by Lismore Capital Limited in its capacity as the legal owner of shares in P&ID, net of applicable costs and commitments, to Mr. Adebayo. 428. Nigeria invites the court to draw the inference that, on behalf of P&ID, Mr. Adebayo corrupted members of Nigeria's legal team, including Mr. Shasosan, Ms. Adelor, and Ms. Belgore at the Ministry of Petroleum Resources, and Mr. Oguin at NNPC, as well as other officials during and after the arbitration, and obtained Nigeria's internal legal documents from some or all of the corrupted lawyers. I accept this area is far from free of suspicion by reference to the evidence I do have, which include receipts by Ms. Belgore. 
However, there are many unanswered questions and alternative possibilities. I have concluded that the invited inference is unsuitably broad, and I respectfully decline to draw it. Mr. Adam Quinn and Mr. Smith. 429. Mr. Adam Quinn and Mr. Smith were not called by P and ID. Mr. Adam Quinn. 430. Mr. Adam Quinn acted for the ISIL group including P and ID. Mr. Andrew confirmed he stood to make in the order of use 2-3 billion if P and ID succeeds in this case. He was involved with P and ID's access to the Nigeria's internal legal documents. 431. Nigeria asks me to draw these main inferences from his absence at the trial, a. Mrs. Grace Tiger received bribes from ISIL group companies, including from P and IDB, there is no legitimate explanation for the receipt of Nigeria's internal legal documents, which came from members of Nigeria's legal team corrupted by those acting for P and ID. C. Mr. Adam Quinn would have knowledge of the lawyers who had been corrupted, D. Mr. Adam Quinn has no innocent explanation for his involvement in paying Dublin expenses, including in concert with Mr. Adebayo. It is not necessary to rely on inferences for, A, and, B, and reliance on inferences is unsuitable for, D, where there are many items bearing that description. I am not persuaded that there is sufficient material to justify the inference at, C. Mr. Smith? 432. My Smith worked closely alongside Mr. Carhill, including over documents and payments. He produced a schedule of payments to Mrs. Grace Tiger in September 2019 which labeled one payment as PR and another as gas contract. Mr. Carhill suggested that this was a mistake and that Mr. Smith was unfamiliar with the purpose of the payments. I was not able to accept the truth of Mr. Carhill's evidence on this point, and the fact that Mr. Smith was not there to explain the position meant that Mr. Carhill did not have the possibility of supporting evidence from him. 433. Nigeria says that. T. Proper inference is that Mr. Smith, if truthful, would have confirmed that bribery and illegality was the modus operandi of those behind P and ID, including that bribes were paid to Mrs. Grace Tiger in connection with the entry of the GSBA. It is not necessary to draw this inference from Mr. Smith's absence as a witness in order to establish that bribes were paid to Ms. Grace Tiger. I do not consider his absence justifies the broader inference claimed, that bribery and illegality was the modus operandi of those behind P and ID. Mr. Bernard McNaughton. 434. Also not called as a witness was a Mr. Bernard McNaughton, a former employee of ISIL group companies. In the event, that there has been sufficient evidence without his, but the apparent circumstances in which he is not giving evidence should be recorded. 435. On the 29th of September 2014, Mr. McNaughton wrote to press Mr. Carhill over payments on his employment with ISIL group, coming to an end. He alleged that there had been various illegal activities during his time working for ISIL group companies and that he held materials to show this. On 20 January 2020, Mr. McNaughton wrote to VR on the same subject and alleged that he held documents showing the same. He wrote again on the 22nd of January 2020 stating that he wished to point out the type of people VR are now assisting and my intentions to turn over all of the information I have to EFCC Nigeria. 436. The next day Mr. McNaughton wrote to a Mr. David Hallett, an employee of ISIL Group, stating his intention to send a file of documents to the EFCC over the weekend. 437. On the 27th of March 2020, Mr. McNaughton asked Mr. Carhill to outline proposals regarding payment to him, saying, On my part, I will make a legal undertaking not to disseminate any information on ISIL work practice or activities by, sick, any individual working for ISIL. 438. On the 15th of May 2020 Mr. McNaughton wrote to Mr. Carhill stating that Mr. Godwin Odama, a former employee of Babcock Electrical Projects Limited, an ISIL group company, 
had been in recent contact with Mr. Nolan's Nigerian lawyer and the lawyer advised Godwin to destroy all records. On the 4th of June 2020, Mr. McNaughton sent an email to Mr. Carhill making further allegations of corruption and illegal activity. 439. An agreement was reached between ISIL and Mr. McNaughton, dated the 10th of April 2020 but signed by Mr. McNaughton on the 8th of July 2020, providing for ISIL to pay Mr. McNaughton between 97,000 and 157,000 out of the proceeds of the final award should P and ID succeed. On the 13th of October 2020, Mr. Carhill made a payment of 10,000 to Mr. McNaughton. Nigeria's allegations against its lawyers. Mr. Shasor San. 440. Did P and ID corrupt Mr. Shasor San, leading counsel for Nigeria in the arbitration until partway into its quantum stage, with a view to achieving a negotiated outcome, or an arbitration award which it could then seek to enforce? Were the arbitration proceedings themselves affected by corruption by the P and ID of Mr. Shasor San? 441. Nigeria contends that Mr. Michael Quinn gave false evidence in the arbitration and that P and ID colluded with Mr. Shasor San, as Nigeria's advocate in the arbitration, to ensure that he did not challenge that false evidence, and he was involved in preventing or hindering Nigeria from putting up a proper defense. Reference is made to his not seeking documents and to delays. 442. Neither party called Mr. Shasor San as a witness at the hearing before me. As far as I am aware, he has not sought independently to provide an account to the court. However, Mr. Shasor San has not, in my judgment, been shown to be corrupt. His actions are inconsistent with Nigeria's theory that he was. For examples suffice. 443. First, his advice to Nigeria to investigate, and allow expert evidence to be obtained, and to proceed in a timely fashion, was sound and constant. Second, he assisted Nigeria to succeed in its applications to the Nigerian court. Third, his participation in the various settlement discussions helped reduce the figures. Fourth, a review of the transcript of the hearing on liability shows repeated robust challenges by him of P&ID, and indeed of the tribunal, and it is impossible to read pages 55 to 59 and 68 to 71 of that transcript as other than properly attempting through argument to secure an outcome in favor of Nigeria. On the other hand, the account given in this judgment shows that responsibility for failures to obtain evidence and to avoid delay lay rather with many ministers and officials, whom Mr. Shasor San and others, including Stevenson Harwood and Mr. Cordara QC at one stage, pressed repeatedly. 444. In a statement of facts and documents concerning bribery, prepared by Nigeria, it is alleged that a payment of 300,000 US dollars by Mr. Shasor San to Mr. Ukiri, was a corrupt payment to Mr. Ukiri in return for which Mr. Ukiri, who did not do any work on the P&ID case, acted as one of Mr. Shasor's conduits in leaking, Nigeria's internal legal documents, and in particular by the email of the 28th of October 2014 in which Mr. Ukiri sent to Mr. Adebayo such a document. There is not the evidence before me at this trial to substantiate this. Mr. Shasor had just been paid more than 1 million US dollars by Nigeria for his legal work. The payment was to his partner in a legal practice. Nothing links Mr. Ukiri's email with the payment, or shows why Mr. Shasor San should go about things in this way if, which I do not accept has been established at this trial, he was behind P and ID receiving copies of Nigeria's internal legal documents. 445. I add that in my view, Nigeria, and specifically Mr. Malami San, the Attorney General, did not in truth believe Mr. Shasor San was corrupt. On the 21st of November 2017, Mr. Shasor San was engaged by Nigeria to represent the Ministry of Power in a $2.4 billion arbitration claim by Sunrise Power and Transmission Company. His appointment was approved by Mr. Malami San on the 6th of March 2018 and formally confirmed by Mr. Malami San on the 18th of March 2018. On the 1st of September 2021, 
Mr. Malami San approved the engagement of Mr. Shasor San's firm to act for Nigeria in a second arbitration brought by Sunrise, resulting from Nigeria's failure to comply with the settlement agreement. The agreed fee was up to 1.15 million US dollars. Mr. Malami San has not explained to this court how these events are consistent with a belief on his and Nigeria's part that Mr. Shasor San had been corrupt in his professional work for Nigeria in the arbitration against P&ID. Mr. Dicko, Ms. Belgor, Ms. Adelor and Mr. Oguin. 446. Nigeria says it is clear, and this court should find, that the corrupted lawyers also included Mr. Dicko, Ms. Adelor, Ms. Belgor, and Mr. Oguin. 447. Here as elsewhere its argument gives no quarter. It writes in closing. In a particularly extraordinary episode in late 2014 and early 2015, Mr. Adebayo persuaded Ms. Adelor, Mr. Oguin and Mr. Chassor to lobby their superiors relentlessly for a settlement of 1.1 billion US dollars. This figure was concocted without any serious attempt to value P and ID's claim. Both Mr. Carhill and Mr. Andrew said in cross-examination, that it was inconceivable that a settlement at that level could have been achieved, certainly before any finding on liability, yet Mr. Adebayo almost managed it, with Ms. Adelor, Mr. Chassor and Mr. Oguin recommending, in privileged advice improperly shared immediately in draft with P&ID on 28 November 2014, that, Nigeria, pay that sum. They were stymied only by the President's refusal to sign off on the proposed settlement in late May 2015. It is no coincidence that huge amounts of cash were withdrawn by Mr. Adebayo, and deposited by Ms. Adelor and Mr. Chassor, over the same period. 448. Within Nigeria, to press hard for settlement at that point was quite understandable, as a realistic approach and deserves no suspicion. I do not give weight to Mr. Carhill and Mr. Andrew's assessment, which was from the perspective of P&ID. The sequence of events set out above shows that 1.1 billion US dollars had a coherent place in the negotiating sequence, in which P and ID had proposed a far higher figure of 1.5 billion US dollars. The president refused to sign off a settlement in May, by then of 850 million US dollars, not 1.1 billion US dollars, because his administration was about to end. 449. On 4 December 2019, Mr. Chassor San stated in an EFCC interview that he made personal gifts of 100,000 US dollars each to Ms. Adelor, former Director of Legal Services, and Mr. Oguin. On 13 September 2019, Mr. Oguin gave a statement in which he said that he received 100,000 US dollars from Mr. Chassor San. This was said to be by way of a loan although no part of it had been repaid. On 6 and 7 May 2020, Ms. Adelor stated in an EFCC interview that she received an unsolicited payment of 100,000 US dollars from Mr. Chassor San. 450. Whatever else may have been the reason for these payments, there was insufficient evidence at this trial that they were bribes by P and ID. The evidence shows nothing in the conduct by Ms. Adelor and Mr. Oguin of Nigeria's case that casts doubt on the level or honesty of their efforts whilst Director of Legal Services to the Ministry and General Counsel to NNPC. 451. There is evidence of Ms. Adelor's bank accounts accumulating sums over the 13-year period 2000, an 8 to 2020 of a scale that bore no relation to her likely salary in 2013 to 2017. This included large amounts of cash deposited in 2014 and 2015. These are matters of concern in the circumstances, but I am cautious in my approach to them as I do not know enough about them. 452. Nigeria points to evidence of direct payments by Mr. Michael Quinn to Mr. Dicko in 2012, including to cover what Mr. Dicko said was the cost of attendance at a legal conference in Dublin. As with Ms. Adelor, there is evidence of unexplained wealth, of Mr. Dicko's bank accounts accumulating sums over the 12-year period 2000, an 8 to 2020 of a scale that bore no relation to his likely salary in 2011 to 2013. 
Again these are matters of concern in the circumstances, but I am cautious in my approach to them as I do not know enough about them. Nigeria's Internal Legal Documents 453. None of this affects the significance of what happened over Nigeria's internal legal documents. These reached P and ID and P and ID retained them. As I have mentioned, some suggestion was made that some, only, would be made available to P and ID to reinforce the message that Nigeria, was serious in its engagement in the arbitration. The majority are not in that category and there is no evidence to satisfy me that their release to and retention by P and ID was authorized. The fact that it is not reliably known who procured them from Nigeria's government offices or those of 20 Marina, is not essential for the purposes of my decision. Nigeria's Allegations Against Others Mr. Tijani 454 On the 8th of January 2020 Mr. Malami San as Attorney General accepted a plea bargain by Mr. Tijani, but required Mr. Tijani to give credible information slash documents that will assist in the investigation and prosecution of P&ID and its associated companies or persons or face having the plea bargain revoked. 455 On the 12th of January 2020, during a 12th interview with the FCC, Mr. Tijani alleged for the first time that the directors of P&ID bribed him with US$50,000 in a black bag in April 2009. In a witness statement that was before Sir Ross Cranston in these proceedings, Mr. Tijani set out a recollection that in early April 2009 that he attended a dinner with Mr. Michael Quinn and Mr. Hitchcock at the Chopsticks restaurant in Abuja, and was given a US$50,000 cash gift by Mr. Hitchcock placed in a black bag in his car. He recalled he was later told by Mr. Hitchcock that P and ID would take care of him further at a later date and that they had made gifts to some other officials at the ministry. There was also an allegation that he overlooked shortcomings in P and ID's bid. 456. Mr. Tijani's account of the black bag gift is disputed by P and ID. I am not prepared to rely on it. I am concerned it cannot be tested satisfactorily, although Mr. Howard Casey did his formidable best to do so through other witnesses. The allegation was first made 10 years later, on 12 January 2020. Mr. Tijani was interviewed by the EFCC about it. He then made a witness statement in these proceedings on 5 June 2020 in which he said the gift in the black bag was made, but I am reluctant simply to accept this, without more. The timing is not straightforward to understand, P and ID was reasonably positioned in April 2009 without the need for this particular payment then. In his witness statement, Mr. Tijani offered, unconvincingly, the explanation that he consider Ed, that Mr. Quinn and Mr. Hitchcock just wanted to be friends with me. There is no real background detail to this particular alleged payment. The method of payment differs from what is known about bribes or alleged bribes to others, including where alleged to have been in cash. 457. Then there was what was known as the Bongo Audit, an episode that in my view is not fully revealed on the available evidence, but is in some respects explicable in terms of reward for later and separate services rendered. Mr. Tijani addresses it in his witness statement, and following the interview by the EFCC, but I am again cautious about that witness statement. It is not disputed that there was an investigation into delays and overspends on an offshore production unit, and that these were to be examined by engineers. On the 4th of March 2013, Mr. Michael Quinn contacted Mr. Tijani, by then retired from the ministry, to discuss this, and there was an email from Mr. Hitchcock. Mr. Tijani forwarded the email to two business associates, explaining that it had been received from one of the guys that I assisted over the years when I was technical advisor to the petroleum minister. On the 1st of June 2013, a contract to supply engineers was executed by Lurgy Consult, an ISIL group company, directed by Mr. Adam Quinn and Mr. Nolan, with Conserve Oil. The owner of Conserve Oil was a childhood friend of Mr. Tijani. 
Mr. Tijani's wife became a director of Conserve Oil in June 2015 and Mr. Tijani was appointed a signatory to the company's bank account around March 2016. 458. There are other episodes alleged but these do not take me much further, individually or cumulatively. Mr. Tijani later sent on the 17th of December 2009 to Mr. Hitchcock an email attaching the CVs of two associates and stating I will appreciate your assistance for employment of any of the two ladies. On the 12th of August, 2013, the retired Mr. Tijani offered his assistance to Mr. Carhill and Michael Quinn in their attempts to enforce a 2004 arbitration award against NNPC and in favor of IPCO, Nigeria, Limited. In 2014 and 2015 Lady Consult made large contributions to the costs of the weddings of Mr. Tijani's son and daughter. This may not have been appropriate, but it was in 2014 and I am not satisfied it was related to the GSBA. Dr. Luckman, Dr. Ibrahim, Mr. Mjida, and Ms. Adarami. 459. Allegations by Nigeria that Dr. Luckman, and Dr. Ibrahim were corrupt were not pursued in any depth by Nigeria at the hearing before me. The same is true in relation to Mr. Njida, a senior special advisor to President Goodluck Jonathan. Its allegations of corruption against Ms. Adarami, secretary to Ms. Grace Tiger, Mr. Dicko, and Ms. Adelor in succession, do not take Nigeria's case further to a material extent. Mr. Malami San, and witness evidence for Nigeria. 460. In a case of this scale and importance, it was unusual that a party should not call any witnesses for cross-examination, but that is the course that Nigeria took. In its written closing P and ID argued. The absence of witnesses means that there is no material to support essential aspects of, Nigeria's, case or contradict essential aspects of P and ID's evidence as shown, in P and ID's closing. In those circumstances, all three of, Nigeria's surviving fraud claims, necessarily fail on the fact's original emphasis. I have not been able to accept this broad argument, but it has properly drawn attention to the importance of close examination of the evidence in each aspect of the case. 461. Nigeria's position is that the main witnesses who might otherwise have been expected to give first-hand evidence for Nigeria, in particular about the award of the GSBA, have been corrupted by P and ID. That position is not a complete answer in my view. For example, P and ID referred to Mr. Ajimagobia San, the Minister of State for Petroleum Resources at the time of the GSBA. There appears to be a question between the parties whether he may have seen an advanced draft of the GSBA. It would have been helpful to have had evidence from someone in a position of seniority, and not the subject of allegations from Nigeria, but there is no basis for an adverse inference in my view. 462. But then there is Mr. Malami San. Mr. Malami San was appointed Attorney General, and Minister of Justice of Nigeria on the 11th of November 2015. He has been involved since. Nigeria did not tender Mr. Malami San as a witness for cross-examination. P and ID contends that the decision by Nigeria not to call any witness who could be cross-examined was motivated by a wish to ensure that its officials should not be exposed to questioning which would show them in a negative light. 463. That may be correct here, but again what matters is evidence. Nigeria's position is that Mr. Malami San was only involved from the quantum stage of the arbitration and could therefore only give first-hand evidence from that point onwards. Mr. Malami San could not have given any relevant evidence, says Nigeria. P and ID's closing contends that had Mr. Malami San or any other representatives of Nigeria been prepared to attend court to support the serious allegations they saw fit to make, P and ID would have been able to question them about a range of relevant matters including 14 that it lists. 464. Three of the matters go to key areas in the case. 1. The circumstances in which the GSBA came to be signed, including what the responsibilities of Mrs. Grace Tiger and Mr. Tijani were, 
and whether the process that was followed was any different from the process for concluding any other Nigerian contract, and in particular any of the other, accelerated gas development project, contracts which were concluded at around the same time. 2. Nigeria s. inept handling of the arbitration, and in particular the reasons why it failed to mount the arguments which it now says would have won it the case, despite the urging of its internal and external advisers. 5. Nigeria s. failure, over a period of several years, to carry out any investigation into the bribery allegations they eventually advanced in December 2019, and in particular Mr. Malami's complete failure to act on the EFCC's advice in 2016 to carry out a detailed investigation into the circumstances surrounding the award of the contract to P&ID. 465. These are areas of the case that I deal with in this judgment on the evidence that I have. They leave Nigeria without a positive case on whether the process followed for concluding the GSBA was different, and why Nigeria did not mount arguments in the arbitration, and over its failure to follow advice and carry out an investigation earlier. However, I do have evidence on what the process was and what arguments were mounted in the arbitration and when it did investigate. 466. P and ID refers, at matters, 3, 4, 12, and, 6, to the alleged conduct of Mr. Malami San in lying to the Vice President, in the aftermath of the Quantum Award, in an attempt to absolve himself from blame, attempting to cover up his own incompetence, following the judgment of Butcher J and telling lies to the BVI Court on, Nigeria S. Norwich Pharmacal Application in 2021, and of Nigeria in making scurrilous allegations against a judge. 467. These matters are collateral to the issues I have to decide, but it is the fact, available to P and ID and reflecting adversely on Nigeria and Mr. Malami San, that Mr. Malami San has not been prepared to address them from the witness box. 468. Three matters go to Nigeria's alleged treatment of witnesses. 7. The shameful persecution of three of P and ID's witnesses, all highly vulnerable individuals, in an attempt to generate false evidence to support, Nigeria S case, referred to a trial only in passing and facetiously, poor grace has been bashed up. 8. Nigeria S the especially depraved treatment of Mr. Kuksi, in denying him access to cancer treatment and forcing him to stand trial, even though, Nigeria S. own counsel submitted within minutes of his cross-examination stating that he was obviously unwell and incapable of understanding the process although later the suggestion by Nigeria was that Mr. Kuktsi was only pretending not to understand the questions put to him. The offenses with which he is charged are ridiculously technical, do not involve any allegations of bribery or corruption or anything relating to P&ID, and are obviously trumped up. Original Emphasis 13. The steps were taken by, Nigeria, no doubt also on Mr. Malami's initiative, to cause criminal proceedings to be instituted against Mr. Carhill in Ireland, in order to harass and intimidate him. 469. These are all matters I am able to, and do, weigh, and weigh in the knowledge that Nigeria has not sought to address them from the witness box. Separately, I take the opportunity to add here that news of the death of Mrs. Grace Tiger since the hearing before me makes some of the rhetoric feel wrong. 470. Three matters go to Nigeria's alleged conduct in relation to the hearing before Sir Ross. 9. Mr. Malami's decision to put forward a false and dishonest case in his evidence before Sir Ross Cranston about the alleged corruption of Mr. Shasosan which has only been abandoned sub silentio in the course of this trial. 10. Mr. Malami's decision to put forward a false case, surely also dishonest, and also now quietly abandoned, to the effect that the GSBA was a sham when the ministry plainly knew that to be untrue. 11. Nigeria s fabrication of obviously false evidence for the hearing before Sir Ross Cranston, in the form of Mr. Tijani's witness statement, in an attempt to make its bribery case coherent, and the circumstances in which that false evidence came to be fabricated. 471. 
The final matter raised by P&ID is a matter on which Nigeria would have been able to question Mr. Malami San or other witnesses had any witness been tendered for cross-examination by Nigeria, was put in these terms. 14. Nigeria's deliberate suppression of documents which exposed its case as false and dishonest, and its broader failure to collect and disclose relevant documents, including any electronic documents from huge swathes of ministry officials. 472. On this matter, I have the documents I have. These result from the disclosure processes required by the court and the channels available to the parties to request orders for more, here and overseas. I am able to, and do, weigh the point that there are further documents that I have not seen. Challenging the award, serious irregularity, section 68 of the Arbitration Act 1996. The Jurisdiction. 473. The full terms of Section 68 of the Arbitration Act 1996 are set out in the Annex to this judgment. They include the following. Challenging the award, serious irregularity. 1. A party to arbitral proceedings may, upon notice to the other parties and to the tribunal, apply to the court challenging an award in the proceedings on the ground of serious irregularity affecting the tribunal, the proceedings, or the award. A party may lose the right to object, see section 73, and the right to apply is subject to the restrictions in section 72 and 3. 2. Serious irregularity means an irregularity of one or more of the following kinds which the court considers as caused or will cause substantial injustice to the applicant. g. The award being obtained by fraud or the award or the way in which it was procured being contrary to public policy. 474. The section is concerned with serious irregularity affecting the tribunal, the, arbitral, proceedings or the award. Subsection, 2, lists nine kinds of irregularity. In the present case, our focus is on kind, g. That is concerned with the award and the way in which it was procured. For irregularity kind, g, it is the award that must be obtained by fraud, it is the award or the way in which the award is procured that must be contrary to public policy. The focus is not on the claim on which the award is based or the cause of action on which the claim is based. Lord Wolfson Casey submitted. The S. 68 jurisdiction is structured and circumscribed and, for sound reasons of policy, requires a close focus on the party's conduct in the arbitration and the process by which the award was obtained. I respectfully agree. 475. The section is founded on the principles, set out in section 1 of the Act, set out in full in the Annex to this judgment, and is to be construed accordingly. Those principles are a. The object of arbitration is to obtain the fair resolution of disputes by an impartial tribunal without unnecessary delay or expense. b. The parties should be free to agree on how their disputes are resolved, subject only to such safeguards as are necessary in the public interest. c. In matters governed by this part, the court should not intervene except as provided by, Part 1 of the Arbitration Act 1996. 476. The objection under consideration in section 68 2G, that of the award being obtained by fraud or the award or the way in which it was procured being contrary to public policy, is of fundamental character to the arbitration process because it goes to the integrity of that process. No policy of arbitration law calls for section 68 2G to be given other than its plain meaning. An award obtained by fraud or contrary to public policy, or procured in a way that was contrary to public policy, and which has caused or will cause substantial injustice is not what the parties agreed to when they agreed on arbitration. To support it in the name of supporting arbitration as a process achieves the opposite. Unless the right to object is lost for reasons of finality, the business of section 73, below, and subject to the procedural restrictions in section 72 and 3, there is no sanctuary. This architecture meets the requirements of justice. 477. 
It is recognized that a high threshold is applicable to Section 68, Lesotho Highlands Development Authority v. Impregilo, 2006, 1 AC 221 at 235 H. per Lord Stain. In Chantiers de l'Atlantique S.A. Vigas Transport and Technigas S.A.S., 2011, E.W.H.C. 3383 Florks J., as he then was, said, fraud, that is dishonest, reprehensible or unconscionable conduct, must be distinctly pleaded and proved, to the heightened burden of proof as discussed in Hornell v. Neuberger Products Limited, 1954, 1QB 247 and Re H. Miners, 1996, AC 563. This was emphasized by Rix L. J., in the Critty Palm, at paragraphs 256 259. 478. As to public policy, in Cuflet Chartering v. Carousel Shipping Company Limited, 2001, 1 Lloyd's Re 707 Moorbic J., as he then was, said. Considerations of public policy can never be exhaustively defined, but they should be approached with extreme caution, it has to be shown that there is some illegality or that the enforcement of the award would be clearly injurious to the public good or, possibly, that enforcement would be wholly offensive to the ordinary reasonable and fully informed member of the public on whose behalf the powers of the state are exercised. 479. The legal principles to be applied by the court in a case under Section 68 2G of the Arbitration Act 1996 are not seriously in issue between the parties. Bribery and the GSBA. 480. The doctrine of separability separates the question of jurisdiction under the arbitration clause in the GSBA from the GSBA itself leaving to one side the ways in which any challenge to the jurisdiction of the tribunal is resolved, the parties agreed that the tribunal, and not this court, should decide their dispute over the GSBA. The question of whether the GSBA was procured by bribery, and the consequences for the GSBA, was for the tribunal. 481. Passages from five decisions within the last nine years are cited by P and ID, Commencing with Honeywell v. Maidon Group LLC, 2014, EWHC 1344, TCC, Paramzi J. at 185. In Honeywell, Ramsey J. said, Whilst bribery is clearly contrary to English public policy, as a matter of English public policy contracts which have been procured by bribes are not unenforceable. As Phillips J., as he then was, made clear in Sinocor v. RBRG Trading, UK, Limited, 2017, 1 Cell C 601 at, 36, the point here was that contracts which have been procured by bribes are not unenforceable but voidable. 482. Mr. Howard K. C. for Nigeria accepts as a correct statement of English law of contract what Ramsey J. said, but contends that it is not, and does not purport to be, a blanket rule about the circumstances in which an award may be set aside for bribery. None of the passages in the five decisions deals in terms with the situation where there is not simply bribery to procure the contract, but there is also further conduct that obtains the award or results in the award or the way in which the award was procured being contrary to public policy. 483. Lord Wolfson K.C. for P and I.D. is correct to criticize Mr. Howard K.C.'s suggestion in the oral opening that Section 68 2G requires you to, ask, whether, enforcement of the awards would offend English public policy. Section 68 2G is not addressing enforcement of an award. Nigeria says of enforcement that, there is no blanket rule that it will never be contrary to English public policy to enforce an award arising out of a contract procured by bribes. The question of whether enforcement of a particular award would offend public policy is, by its nature, one which will depend on the facts of each case. Nigeria's point that the answer to the question will depend on the facts of each case where the subject is enforcement helps one understand that the contention that there is no blanket rule does not reframe the question whether under Section 68 2G or Section 103, as a question about the contract rather than a question about the award. 484. 
Nigeria also contends that under Nigerian law it would have been entitled to avoid the GSBA, or at least terminate it going forwards, and therefore deprive P&ID of its right to performance for the 20-year term, because it had been procured by bribes. Further, the revelation of the bribery would also have shown that the GSBA had been procured through lies told by P&ID about to its ability and willingness to perform the contract and that the contract was instead passed through without any due diligence. These points too are directed to the contract not the award. 485. But Nigeria presses the argument that there was a real and direct link between on the one hand bribery and, alleged, misrepresentation to procure the GSBA, and on the other hand the outcome of the awards and that that is enough. Thus, it argues. The bribes paid by P and ID around the time of the GSBA induced Nigeria's officials to award a contract on terms which purported to place the risk of failing to supply, non-existent, gas on the government, a government lock-in basis, on the premise of lies about, I, P and ID's readiness and ability to perform and, 2, the fact that suitable sources of gas had already been identified by P and ID. 486. I cannot, with respect, accept the approach. In almost any case where an award is based on a contract procured by bribery and misrepresentation, there will be a real and direct link, the approach would involve the court reaching a conclusion about the contract rather than the award. 487. P and ID's response brings out the further difficulties in Nigeria's just mentioned approach. Bribes that P and ID allegedly paid to procure the GSBA are a very long way from the awards, a huge number of contingencies had to be satisfied, including Nigeria's failure to perform, P and ID's acceptance of that repudiatory breach, and then the entirety of the arbitral process leading to P and ID successfully obtaining the awards. To find that pre-GSBA payments from, say, 2009 were the reason why P and ID obtained the final award dated 2017 is to give no real meaning to the causal link in the phrase obtained by fraud. An overall fraudulent enterprise. 488. However in my judgment well within section 68 2G would be a case where there is an overall fraudulent enterprise or plan from the start to procure an award. Here the contract is a first or early step in carrying out that overall fraudulent enterprise or plan, but the result is the award. 489. At the point of entering into the GSBA did P and ID intend, fraudulently to extract large sums of money from Nigeria by means of an arbitration or a corrupt settlement. Was, at least what appeared to be, the commercial contract, the GSBA, from the start, simply a device as part of a fraudulent scheme to procure an arbitration award, or settlement, in favor of P and ID. 490. Here, I am satisfied that P and ID did intend to perform the GSBA when it entered into it, and that there were means by which it could have done so. Nigeria has characterized the GSBA as a sham and contended that P and ID as a BVI registered company with no obvious assets, no relevant experience, and few employees, had no genuine intention of performing the GSBA, and would never have been able to do so. However, P and ID did not have to contemplate performing the GSBA itself with its assets, experience, and employees. This is not, as it represented because it could simply use the work on Project Alpha to perform the GSBA. It is rather because ISIL Group had shown in the past that they could contract in. 491. Whilst P and ID was prepared to bribe in the course of its business, I do not accept it was of the sophistication to conceive at the contract stage a plan to extract large sums of money from Nigeria by means of an arbitration or a corrupt settlement. Consistently, P and ID did not use the GSBA to move directly to arbitration at the first available opportunity. I have found it did not, as alleged by Nigeria, corrupt Mr. Shasosan. And it appointed, in Sir Anthony Evans, an arbitrator of unquestioned experience, expertise, and independence. 492. 
It is in these circumstances that I have reached the conclusion that the present is not a case in which, when the parties entered into the GSBA, P and ID's intention was not to perform it but simply to use it as a device to get an award or settlement. However, that is not the end of Nigeria's Section 68 2G challenge. Knowingly false evidence, continued bribery, and retention of Nigeria's internal legal documents. 493. There remain three things that bring the case within Section 68 2G, in my judgment, as an irregularity, to use the language of the section. Each amounted to fraud by which the awards were obtained, and by reason of them, the awards or the way in which the awards were procured was contrary to public policy. 494. The first is P and ID's providing to the tribunal and relying on evidence before the tribunal that was material but was evidence that P and ID knew to be false. Specifically, this was the evidence of Mr. Michael Quinn in his witness statement of the 14th of February 2014, that he was explaining, how the GSBA came about when he did not do that because he did not mention that Mrs. Grace Tiger had been paid a 5,000 US dollars bribe at the end of December 2009 and a 5,000 bribe on the 29th of March 2010, c. 168-177, 247, 254, and 417, above. 495. The second is P and ID's continued bribery or corrupt payment of Mrs. Grace Tiger directed to the arbitration period in order to suppress from the tribunal and Nigeria the fact that she had been bribed when the GSBA came about. This continued bribery or corrupt payment is fairly described by Nigeria as bribery to keep her on side, and to buy her silence about the earlier bribery. Specifically, these were bribes or corrupt payments on 14th of July, 14 August, and the 30th of September 2015 totaling NGN 220,000, then equivalent to 900 US dollars, a bribe or corrupt payment on the 14th of September 2015 of 1,000 US dollars and a bribe or corrupt payment on the 14th of June 2016 of 3,000 US dollars, sent to Vera Tiger, c. 401, 405, above. 496. The third is P and ID's improper retention of Nigeria's internal legal documents that it had received during the arbitration. It retained these, rather than returned them unread, so as to monitor Nigeria's position and awareness as the arbitration continued. This included monitoring whether Nigeria had become aware of the deception being practiced by P and ID on the tribunal and on Nigeria as a party before the tribunal. Specifically, there was a flow of over 40 of Nigeria's internal legal documents to P and ID during the period of the arbitration from commencement on the 22nd of August, 2012 to final award on the 31st of January 2017. The detail of the contents of a number of them is discussed above. All are material, including for the fact that they showed to P and ID that Nigeria had no awareness that Mrs. Grace Tiger had been bribed when the GSBA came about and that bribery or corrupt payments continued to buy her silence. 497. These three things do not represent the full extent of the fraud and conduct contrary to public policy on the part of P and ID that was shown at the trial. But it is these three things that are central to Nigeria's challenge under Section 68. They do not, it will be noted, include separately Mr. Quinn's evidence about finance and engineering, but that is because those areas face the difficulty, brought out by Lord Wolfson KC, particularly in his argument under Section 73, made at the trial, that Mr. Quinn's evidence on them was, to some extent, already challenged or the subject of attempts at challenge in the arbitration, including by Mr. Shasor San at the hearing on liability. It was Nigeria's own case in the arbitration, including at the hearing on quantum, that P and ID had done nothing under the GSBA. 498. Section 68 next requires the court to consider whether the irregularity, to use the language of the section, has caused or will cause substantial injustice to Nigeria. If it has then it is a serious irregularity under the section. Serious irregularity, 
substantial injustice. 499. There can be no question that fraud and conduct contrary to public policy are serious in themselves. However when section 68 refers to seriousness its focus is on the consequences, and specifically the consequences for justice. It asks whether substantial injustice has been or will be caused, to the party applying to the court. 500. In Rav Bahamas v Therapy Beach Club, 2021, UKPC 8. 2021, AC 907 The Privy Council considered Section 90 of the Bahamas Arbitration Act 2009, the 2009 Act, a section modelled on and something that is materially identical to Section 68 of the English Arbitration Act 1996. Lords Hamblin and Burroughs said. 30. As was explained in the 1996 report on the Arbitration Bill, which became the 1996 Act, of the Departmental Advisory Committee on Arbitration Law, the DAC, the test of serious irregularity was intended to limit intervention to extreme cases where it could be said that the tribunal has gone so wrong in its conduct of the arbitration that justice calls out for it to be corrected. As set out at Para 280 of the DAC report. 280. Irregularities stand on a different footing. Here we consider that it is appropriate, indeed essential, that these have to pass the test of causing substantial injustice before the court can act. The court does not have a general supervisory jurisdiction over arbitrations. We have listed the specific cases where a challenge can be made under this clause. The test of substantial injustice is intended to be applied by way of support for the arbitral process, not by way of interference with that process. Thus it is only in those cases where it can be said that what has happened is so far removed from what could reasonably be expected of the arbitral process that we would expect the court to take action. The test is not what would have happened had the matter been litigated. To apply such a test would be to ignore the fact that the parties have agreed to arbitrate, not litigate. Having chosen arbitration, the parties cannot validly complain of substantial injustice unless what has happened simply cannot on any view be defended as an acceptable consequence of that choice. In short, Clause 68 is really designed as a long stop, only available in extreme cases where the tribunal has gone so wrong in its conduct of the arbitration that justice calls out for it to be corrected. Emphasis added. 31. In accordance with this guidance the test of serious irregularity has been recognized as imposing a high threshold or high hurdle, see, for example, the Soto at Para 28, Lord Stain, ABD AGV Hochtief Airport GmbH, 2006, EWHC 388, com. 2006, 1 all ER, com. 529 at Para 63 and the cases there cited, Tomlinson J. 32. The focus is on due process, not the correctness of the decision reached, see, for example, Petroship's Private Limited v Ptech Trading and Investment Corn, the Petro Ranger, 2001, 2 Lloyds Rep 348 at 351, Abuja International Hotels Limited v. Meridian SAS, 2012, EWHC 87, com. 2012, 1 Lloyds Rep 461, at Para 49, Primera Maritime, Hellas, Limited v Jiangsu Eastern Heavy Industry Company Limited, 2013, EWHC 3066, com. 2014, 1 All ER, com. 813 at Para 6. As Lord Stain stated in Lesotho at Para 29, Referring to Section 68 of the 1996 Act which is equivalent to Section 90 of the 2009 Act. Nowhere in Section 68, 90, is there any hint that a failure by the tribunal to arrive at the correct decision could afford a ground for challenge. 33. Even if a case is shown to fall within one or more of the kinds of irregularities listed in section 90 this will only amount to a serious irregularity if the court considers that it has caused or will cause substantial injustice. This means more than some injustice. As Coleman J. explained in Bullfrotted P. 687. 
Those who framed the bill contemplated that the court's intervention would be engaged not merely in those cases where some injustice has been caused to the applicant by the incidence of the serious irregularity but where the substance and nature of the injustice goes well beyond what could reasonably be expected as an ordinary incident of arbitration. 34. There will be substantial injustice where it is established that, had the irregularity not occurred, the outcome of the arbitration might well have been different, see, for example, the Networks Limited v. Econet Wireless International Limited, 2004, EWHC 2909, com. 2005, 1 All ER, com. 303 at para 90, Coleman J. It is not necessary to show that the outcome would necessarily or even probably be different, Cameroon Airlines v. Transnet Limited, 2004, EWHC 1829, com. 2006, TCLR1, at para 102, Langley J. As stated by Akinhead J. in Raytheon at para 33i. I, for the purposes of meeting the substantial injustice test, an applicant need not show that it would have succeeded on the issue with which the tribunal failed to deal or that the tribunal would have reached a conclusion favorable to him, it, is, necessary only for him to show that, i, his position was reasonably arguable, and, 2, had the tribunal found in his favor, the tribunal might well have reached a different conclusion in its award. 35. Some irregularities may be so serious that substantial justice is inherently likely or likely in the very nature of things to result. As Toulson J. stated in Ascot Commodities Nevada v. Olam International Limited, 2002, sale C277 at pp 284F 285A. Since the whole process of arbitration is intended as a way of determining points at issue, it is more likely to be a matter of serious irregularity if on a central matter, a finding is made on a basis which does not reflect the case which the party complaining reasonably thought he was meeting, or a finding is ambiguous, or an important issue is not addressed, than if the complaints go simply to procedural matters. It is inherently likely to be a source of serious injustice if irregularities occurred of the kind to which I have referred. Since the purpose of arbitration is to determine central issues between the parties, if there has been a flaw in that this has not been done, that is likely in the very nature of things to be a matter of serious injustice. Emphasis added. 36. In such cases substantial injustice may be inferred from the nature of the irregularity and that inference may be so strong that it almost goes without saying, see Raytheon at Para 61. In that case, the arbitrators had failed to deal with key issues which may well have impacted on an award of some 126 meters. 37. In general, there will, however, be no substantial injustice if it can be shown that the outcome of the arbitration would have been the same regardless of the irregularity, see, for example, Raytheon Para 33, last sub-paragraph. 501. Although the Act contains its own express criteria for applications under Section 68 2G the approach of the Court in relation to domestic judgments must be a useful comparator when applications were made to set aside arbitration awards, particularly bearing in mind that the decision was reached by the Tribunal of the Party's Choice, DDT Trucks of North America v. DDT Holdings, 2007, 2 Lloyds Rep. 213. 2007, EWHC 1542, com, at, 22, 23, per Cook J. 502. Under that approach, an applicant must show that new evidence would have had an important influence on the result, Westacre Investments Incorporated v. Ugo Import SDPR Holding Company Limited, 1999, 2 Lloyds Rep 65 at 76 to 77, Waller LJ. Blair J. elegantly captured the relationship between this aspect of the jurisdiction in relation to judgments and the statutory jurisdiction in relation to arbitration awards when he observed in double K that the latter point, important influence on the result, takes effect within the statutory requirement that the irregularity has caused or will cause substantial injustice to the applicant, Thyssenat, 65. In Takar v. Gracefield Developments Limited, 2019, 
UKSC 13, 2020, AC 450 at, 56, 57, 67, 76, and, 104, the Supreme Court approved and discussed the summary, identified by New EJ at first instance, of the principles governing applications to set aside judgments for fraud by Aikens LJ in Royal Bank of Scotland PLC v Highland Financial Partners LP, 2013, 1 sale C 596 at, 106. 503. Reflecting the concern for a rigor in approach in this area, in Westacre Wall LJ continued, dissenting in the result, in the context of the particular type of irregularity that was before the court, by saying that the jurisdiction required evidence. So material that its production, at trial, would probably have affected the result and, when the fraud consists of perjury, is so strong that it would reasonably be expected to be decisive at the re-hearing and if unanswered must have that result. 504. But results should be understood broadly, as what happened. There will be a range of situations, and to allow for that the matter can be put more broadly, as the Privy Council did in Rav Bahamas, there will be substantial injustice where it is established that, had the irregularity not occurred, the outcome of the arbitration might well have been different. This further respects the fact that Section 68 2G concerns not just the award being obtained by fraud or being contrary to public policy, but also the way in which the award was procured being contrary to public policy. 505. Lord Wolfson Casey argued that the applicant alleging that substantial injustice was caused must show that but for the irregularity, the tribunal might well have reached a different view and produced a significantly different outcome and, referring to Nigeria's written opening, that that was common ground. In my judgment, it is one of the ways in which the requirement for causation may be and has been put, but it is and has not been intended as a comprehensive description. Section 68 2G says simply that it is a substantial injustice to the applicant that has to be shown. And this is substantial injustice that the serious irregularity has caused or will cause. I should add that I do not consider that the relevant paragraph in Nigeria's written opening does quite create common ground as suggested. 506. Lord Wolfson Casey referred to the decision of Sir Ross Cranston in Africa Sourcing Cameras Limited VLMBS, 2023, EWHC 150. This concerned an allegation of serious irregularity in the form of apparent bias in relation to the chair of the tribunal. The challenge was under section 68 2A. Sir Ross said. There is no support in RAV for the suggestion that in a section 68 application, a finding of apparent bias in an arbitration tribunal will lead as a matter of course to a finding of substantial injustice. Rather, as we have seen, the effect of the Privy Council's advice is that a case within Section 68 2 will not constitute a serious irregularity unless the court considers that it has caused substantial injustice, although the nature of the irregularity may be such that the inference of substantial injustice almost goes without saying. Moreover, there will be no substantial injustice if it can be shown that the outcome of the arbitration would have been the same regardless of the irregularity. 507. It is the last sentence that Lord Wolfson Casey emphasizes. But Sir Ross made clear he was dealing with the situation where the serious irregularity was apparent bias, and apparent bias not actual bias. If it can be shown that the outcome of the arbitration would have been the same regardless of apparent bias then it seems clear that there will be no substantial injustice. That is what Sir Ross was saying, and in my respectful view, he was correct. 508. The citation of the case by Lord Wolfson Casey also allows emphasis that whether it is in fact possible to show that the outcome of the arbitration would have been the same will be different depending on the circumstances of the case and the nature of the challenge. Perhaps there is much to be said for this aspect of these challenges to be left with the words of the section serious irregularity means an irregularity of one or more of the following kinds which the court considers has caused or will cause substantial injustice to the applicant, keeping in mind the text of the DAC report to which the Privy Council referred. 509. In the present case, 
The core is the bribery of Mrs. Grace Tiger when the GSBA was being made. It is the fact of that bribery that Mr. Michael Quinn falsely concealed by the words of his witness statement, and that the continued bribery or corrupt payments sought to suppress. It is that that P and ID was monitoring, among other things, by its retention of the Nigeria's internal legal documents. 510. In its written closing P and ID argues that, any perjury that took place did not cause any substantial injustice within the meaning of S. 68 as it did not bring about the awards, or any of them. I respectfully disagree. The awards were the result of the arbitration that happened. There is no question to my mind that the arbitration would have been completely different, and in ways strongly favorable to Nigeria, had the fact of the bribery of Mrs. Grace Tiger when the GSBA was being made been before the tribunal. It would have brought in the issue of whether the GSBA was procured by fraud, and as a result voidable. Discovery of the concealment would have completely altered the tribunal's approach to the rest of Mr. Michael Quinn's evidence. 511. I have no hesitation in concluding that Nigeria suffered substantial injustice within the meaning of the section. And that is even before taking into account what P and ID did with Nigeria's internal legal documents. 512. P and ID says here again P and ID's obtaining of these did not cause any substantial injustice within section 68, because it had no effect whatsoever on the awards, irrespective of how or from whom the documents were obtained, they did not cause substantial injustice because they gave P and ID no relevant advantage in the arbitration. I must again respectfully reject the argument. The court will be realistic here about what proof is possible in terms of showing the effect of a dishonest course of conduct. The nature and contents of the documents and the scale, continuity, and circumstances of P and ID's conduct were such that, in my judgment, Nigeria's right to confidential access to legal advice was utterly compromised throughout all or most of the arbitration. It was effectively denied an important part of the process of arbitration. Here too I have no doubt that had the tribunal known, its approach would have been very different. 513. In this connection, reference was made to the decision of the Court of Appeal in Hamilton v. Al-Fayed, 2001. EMLR 15. The Court of Appeal considered an appeal against a judgment at trial. It examined whether the purchase of stolen privileged documents had given any significant procedural advantage at the trial, finding that it had not, the documents had not been used to obtain a tactical advantage in the litigation, let alone, had they, enabled him to obtain a favorable verdict when otherwise he might not have done so. 514. An application under section 68 is not of course an appeal, but for present purposes, it is important to emphasize the difference between the circumstances of that case and this. On the appeal, the court examined the effect of specific identified use of privileged documents at a trial. It was realistically possible to inquire into the question of tactical advantage and effect on verdict. Here the court on a section 68 application is faced with conduct throughout the course of an arbitration. There are limits to the feasibility and reliability of an attempt to capture the advantages enjoyed in the latter situation and how those may or will have affected the conduct of the arbitration, and as a result the outcome of the arbitration. 515. Section 68 asks not only whether the award was obtained by fraud but also whether the way in which the award was procured was contrary to public policy. The focus here is on the process by which an award was achieved. Approached with the extreme caution mentioned by Mobik J in Qflip Chartering, above, the language of the section in my judgment applies where, as here, Nigeria was comprehensively deprived of its right to legal professional privilege throughout the process. 516. I reach these views of the matter without reluctance. P and ID has the awards only after and by practicing the most severe abuses of the arbitral process. As a result, Nigeria had a right to object under Section 68 2G of the Arbitration Act 1996. True. There were other causes of the awards, 
including incompetence and neglect throughout the arbitration on the part of Nigeria, acting through a number of individuals. But the presence of these causes does not detract from the effects of P&ID's abusive conduct. If this was a fight it was not a fair one, and could not lead to a just result. 517. If I go back to the passages of the DAC report cited by Lords Hamblin and Burroughs JJSC, the present is a standout example of a case where justice calls out for correction. It is readily seen that what has happened is so far removed from what could reasonably be expected of the arbitral process that it is to be expected that the court will take action, and to do so is by way of support for the arbitral process, not by way of interference with that process a phrase also brought out by Cresswell J. in the Petro Ranger, 2001, EWHC 418, com. 2001, 2 Lloyds Rep 348 at 351. Loss of Right to Object, Section 73 of the Arbitration Act 1996. Section 73. 518. In trying to take a path through this judgment in a way that may be of assistance to different audiences, I reach this important point last. It was, properly, a significant part of the case that Lord Wolfson Casey presented on behalf of P and ID. 519. By Section 73 of the Arbitration Act 1996, so far as material. 1. If a party to arbitral proceedings takes part, or continues to take part, in the proceedings without making, either forthwith or within such time as is allowed by the arbitration agreement or the tribunal or by any provision of this part, any objection, a, that the tribunal lacks substantive jurisdiction, or, d, that there has been any other irregularity affecting the tribunal or proceedings, he may not raise that objection later, before the tribunal or the court, unless he shows. At the time he took part or continued to take part in the proceedings, he did not know and could not with reasonable diligence have discovered the grounds for the objection. 520. Thus, for a party to the arbitral proceedings who takes part, or continues to take part, in the proceedings the objection is to be made either forthwith or within such time as is allowed by the arbitration agreement or the tribunal or by any provision of this part of the Arbitration Act 1996. If it is not, then it may not be made later before the tribunal or the court unless the party did not know and could not with reasonable diligence have discovered the grounds for the objection at the time he took part or continued to take part in the proceedings. The grounds of objection with which section 73 is concerned are those that occurred, even though not raised, up to the date of a final award, this is the point that is addressed at Merkin and Flannery on the Arbitration Act 1996, 6th edition, at, 73.7. 521. There is a valuable explanation of section 73 in Rustal Trading v. Gill and Duffus S.A., 2000, 1 Lloyd's Rep. 14 by Mobik J., as he then was. At 19 to 20, he said. The effect of this section is that a party to an arbitration must act promptly if he considers that there are grounds on which he could challenge the effectiveness of the proceedings. If he fails to do so and continues to take part in the proceedings, he will be precluded from making a challenge at a later date. Moreover, it is clear from the language of sub s. 1, itself that it is unnecessary for an applicant to have had actual knowledge of the grounds of objection in order for him to lose his right to challenge the award. If the respondent can show that the applicant took part or continued to take part in the proceedings without objection after the grounds of objection had arisen, the burden passes to the applicant to show that he did not know, and could not with reasonable diligence have discovered, those grounds at the time. It may often be necessary, therefore, to consider the applicant's conduct of the proceedings against the background of his developing state of knowledge. 522. A number of authorities have identified or confirmed that the fundamental principle, or policy, involved is that of fairness, and justice, in the sense of openness and fair dealing between the parties, see Moorbick J. in Rustle, above, at 19-20, Coleman J. in J.S.C. Zestaphony v. Roney Holdings Limited, 2004, EWHC 245, com. 2004, 
2 Lloyds Rep 335 at 64 Cook J in Thyssen Canada Limited v Mariana Maritime SA 2005 EWHC 219 com 2005 1 Lloyds Rep 640 at 18 Aikens J in Prime Trade AGV Ethan Limited 2005 EWHC 2399 com 2006 1 Lloyds Rep 457 at 59 61 and Car J in CVD1 2015 EWHC 2126 com at 150 Province of Balochistan v Tethian Copper Company Proprietary Limited 2021 EWHC 1884 com 2021 2 Lloyds Rep 443 at 110 Robin Knowles J in a list of points improved by Butcher J in National Iranian Oil Company v. 1. Crescent Petroleum Company International Limited, 2. Crescent Gas Corporation Limited, 2022, EWHC 2641. Com. At. 36. Section 73 with Section 68 2G. 523. Section 68 itself provides that a party may lose the right to object, see Section 73. Section 73 1D is concerned, in terms, with the objection that there has been an irregularity affecting the tribunal or proceedings. Section 68 is concerned, in terms, with serious irregularity affecting the tribunal, the proceedings or the award. As already noted, there will be an irregularity under Section 68 2G where an award was obtained by fraud or the award or the way in which it was procured was contrary to public policy. Takar, in the UK Supreme Court. 524. In Takar v Gracefield Developments Limited, above, the Supreme Court addressed setting aside, not an arbitration award, but a judgment of the court on grounds of fraud. Nigeria argues that the effect of Takar is that. As a matter of law, it is not open to a fraudster who has obtained a judgment by fraud, including through perjured evidence, to profit from it by contending that the innocent party has acted negligently in failing to uncover his fraud sooner. Law Wolfson Casey for P and ID properly accepted that a reasonable diligence requirement now doesn't apply when you are applying to set aside a judgment for fraud at common law or equity. 525. Lord Kerr, with whose speech Lord Hodge, Lord Lloyd-Jones, and Lord Kitchen agreed, said in Takar at, 54, 55. 54, in my view, it ought now to be recognized that where it can be shown that a judgment has been obtained by fraud, and where no allegation of fraud had been raised at the trial which led to that judgment, a requirement of reasonable diligence, should not be imposed on the party seeking to set aside the judgment. 55. Two qualifications to that general conclusion should be made. Where fraud has been raised at the original trial and new evidence as to the existence of the fraud is prayed in aid to advance a case for setting aside the judgment, it seems to me that it can be argued that the court having to deal with that application should have a discretion as to whether to entertain the application. The second relates to the possibility that, in some circumstances, a deliberate decision may have been taken not to investigate the possibility of fraud in advance of the first trial, even if that had been suspected. If that could be established, again, I believe that a discretion whether to allow an application to set aside the judgment would be appropriate but, once more, I express no final view on the question. 526. Lord Hodge, Lord Lloyd-Jones, and Lord Kitchen also agreed with the speech of Lord Sumption. Lord Sumption's opinion was, at, 66. 66. I would leave open the question of whether the position as I have summarized it is any different where the fraud was raised in the earlier proceedings but unsuccessfully. My provisional view is that the position is the same, for the same reasons. If decisive new evidence is deployed to establish the fraud, an action to set aside the judgment will lie irrespective of whether it could reasonably have been deployed on the earlier occasion unless a deliberate decision was then taken not to investigate or rely on the material. 
527. In the present case, Sir Ross Cranston addressed the question of whether Takar affected the position where an arbitration award rather than a judgment was involved. After summarizing the arguments addressed to him, from Mr. Howard K.C. for Nigeria and from Mr. Ian Mill K.C. who then appeared for P&ID, Sir Ross expressed his view as follows. 183. If it had been necessary to decide the issue, it seems to me that Mr. Howard has the best of the arguments. It is a fundamental principle of our law that, as Lord Bingham said in High Casualty and General Insurance Limited v. Chase Manhattan Bank, 2003, UKHL 6, 2003, 2 Lloyds Rep 61, referring to what Rick's LJ had said in the Court of Appeal, that fraud is a thing apart, it unravels all, 15. There seems to be no reason why the finality of arbitration awards should be afforded greater importance than the finality of judgments in circumstances of fraud. The statutory bar in section 73 is limited to irregularities discoverable during the arbitration. Otherwise, the effect of section 81 one of the Arbitration Act 1996 is to preserve the right to challenge the enforcement of an award on public policy grounds under the common law. As Mr. Howard contended, there is no reason to interpret the Act so that Takar is confined to common law public policy challenges and not to those under Section 68 2G. In the passage from the speech of Lord Bingham, to which Sir Ross referred, Lord Bingham had continued. It also reflects the practical basis of commercial intercourse. Once fraud is proved, it vitiates judgments, contracts and all transactions whatsoever, Lazarus Estates Limited v. Beasley, 1956, 1 QB 702 at 712, per Denning LJ. 528. Nigeria argues that the submission that the judge accepted was that Takar applies equally to challenges to set aside an arbitral award under Section 68 of the 1996 Act and that he was not limiting his comments to S.85. Nigeria argues. There is no principled basis to distinguish between the test for extending time under S.85, which is a test of reasonable diligence, and the test under S.73 which is also a test of reasonable diligence. Takar applies to both. 529. Section 85 does not contain the express statutory reference to reasonable diligence that Section 73 does. It is in these terms. Where any provision of this part requires an application or appeal to be made to the court within a specified time, the rules of court relating to the reckoning of periods, the extending or abridging of periods, and the consequences of not taking a step within the period prescribed by the rules, apply in relation to that requirement. It is one thing to draw on Takar in interpreting section 85, it is another to do so in interpreting section 73. 530. Sir Ross clearly appreciated this. He referred to, T. He statutory bar in section 73 and that it was limited to irregularities discoverable during the arbitration, see also, 152. Otherwise, he said the effect of section 81 one of the act is to preserve the right to challenge the enforcement of an award on public policy grounds under the common law. 531. Takar states the common law and equity. Sir Ross accepted the force of Mr. Howard Casey's contention that there is no reason to interpret the Act so that Takar is confined to common law public policy challenges and not to those under Section 68 2G. But that is not to say that, T. He statutory bar in Section 73 does not apply. Rather, it is to state that Takar applies where it is sought to extend the time for a challenge under Section 68 2G, which was the issue before Sir Ross. Sections 68 1 and 73 both make plain that any challenge brought under Section 68 can be barred under Section 73. In my judgment, Lord Wolfson Casey is right to say, in summary, that for arbitration awards reasonable diligence is in the statute and Takar does not change the statute. Statutory context of course continues to be provided by Section 1, and the principles there set out. Reasonable diligence. 
532. How does the requirement of reasonable diligence in section 73 apply in the particular circumstances of section 68 2G, that is, where the allegation is that an award was obtained by fraud or the award or the way in which it was procured was contrary to public policy? 533. The requirement under section 73 is could not with reasonable diligence. The language is not should not, as Lord Wolfson Casey emphasized, in my view correctly. I do not consider that Burton J. in H. J. Hines v. E. F. L., 2010, 1 Lloyd's Rep. 727 at, 31. 33, was suggesting otherwise, and I appreciate that some would point out that to say a person could have discovered something with reasonable diligence means that they should have. When Nigeria says in its written opening, in this respect, the test is not whether Nigeria's legal team could by any means have discovered P&ID's dishonesty, but whether it should have done so, the test does not involve the word should but the test also does not include the words any means. The words with reasonable diligence are very important. 534. Takar assists with the meaning and understanding of what the law does and does not expect of the victim as a reasonable person in the specific context of fraud. Mr. Howard Casey draws on this passage from Lord Sumption's opinion in Takaret, 63, Lord Hodge, Lord Lloyd-Jones, and Lord Kitchen agreed with Lord Sumption, but CF on this point Lord Briggs at, 88. Proceedings of this kind are abusive only where the point at issue and the evidence deployed in support of it not only could have been raised in the earlier proceedings but should have been, see Johnson v. Gorewood and Company, at P31, Lord Bingham of Cornhill, and Virgin Atlantic Airways Limited v Zodiac Seats UK Limited, Para 22, Lord Sumption. As Lord Bingham observed in the former case, it is wrong to hold that because a matter could have been raised in earlier proceedings it should have been, so as to render the raising of it in later proceedings necessarily abusive. The should in this formulation refers to something which the law would expect a reasonable person to do in his own interest, and in that of the efficient conduct of litigation. However, the basis on which the law makes transactions, including judgments, which have been procured by fraud is that a reasonable person is entitled to assume honesty in those with whom he deals. He is not expected to conduct himself or his affairs on the footing that other persons are dishonest unless he knows that they are. That is why it is not a defense to an action in deceit to say that the victim of the deceit was foolish or negligent to allow himself to be taken in, Central Railway Company of Venezuela v. Kish, 1867, LR2 HL99, 120, Lord Chelmsford, Redgrave v. Heard, 1881, 20 Sage D1, 13 to 17, Jessel Mister. It follows that unless on the earlier occasion, the claimant deliberately decided not to investigate a suspected fraud or rely on a known one, it cannot be said that he should have raised it. Lord Hodge, Lord Lloyd-Jones, and Lord Kitchen agreed with the speech of Lord Sumption, but CF on this point Lord Briggs at, 88. 535. For Nigeria, Mr. Howard K.C. argues that there is no reason in principle why a different approach should apply to arbitral awards whereby approach is meant the explanation of what the law does and does not expect of the victim as a reasonable person, in the specific context of fraud, I agree. 536. At the same time Lord Wolfson K.C., for P&ID, highlights this passage from Ot Computers Limited v. Infineon Technologies AG, 2021, Eucasif 501. Although some of the cases have spoken in terms of reasonable diligence only being required once the claimant is on notice that there is something to investigate, the trigger, it is more accurate to say that the requirement of reasonable diligence applies throughout. The passage addresses section 321A of the Limitation Act 1980 but I accept that it informs the correct approach in the present context too. 537. For P and ID, Lord Wolfson Casey further argues that where, as here, one of the questions is whether the claimant knew or could, with reasonable diligence, have discovered the material needed to bring a fraud claim, then whether the defendant disputes whether there was a fraud, does not answer the question. 
he references ABV Ministry of Defense, 2013, 1 AC 78, per Lord Wilson, but note also Lord Hope and Lord Walker in Deutsche Morgan Grenfell, 2007, 1 AC 558. In my view Lord Wolfson Casey is correct, but it must be kept in mind that the material needed will have to be sufficient to enable fraud to be alleged or pleaded, the Law Society v. Sefton and Company, 2004, Yukasiv 1627, 2005, QV 1013 at, 110, per Neuberger LJ and Park v. St. G. per Andrews LJ. This case, preliminary. 538. I understood Nigeria to argue that Section 73 did not arise on those parts of Nigeria's case that alleged corruption by P&ID of Nigeria's own lawyers and those parts that concerned Nigeria's internal legal documents. The alleged corruption by P&ID of Nigeria's own lawyers is no longer relevant at this point but that is because I have found that allegation not to be made out on the evidence available to me at this trial. But otherwise, I consider I should address Section 73 wherever I have held that Section 68 2G gives Nigeria a right to object on the facts of this case as I have found them to be. This is because Section 73 says that a party, here, Nigeria, may not raise an objection unless he shows that the requirements of Section 73 are met. 539. Nigeria also takes a point about P&ID's pleading and particularization of its contention under Section 73. P&ID's defense states that Nigeria was on notice of matters on which it now seeks to rely at the time of the arbitration, or could have discovered them. Nigeria added the suggestions that this was not a plea about bribery at all and that P&ID relied on Section 73 only in respect of Nigeria's case on Mr. Quinn's perjured evidence. 540. P and ID's defense is brief, but in the circumstances of this case, I propose to treat it as sufficient. I keep in mind the way things were put by Moabic J in Rustle. If the respondent can show that the applicant took part or continued to take part in the proceedings without objection after the grounds of objection had arisen, the burden passes to the applicant to show that he did not know and could not with reasonable diligence have discovered, those grounds at the time. The fact remains that Nigeria invokes Section 68 and Section 73 requires Nigeria to show, at the time, it, took part or continued to take part in the proceedings, it, did not know and could not with reasonable diligence have discovered the grounds for the objection. That is what I should examine. In doing so I keep in mind that Nigeria does not call a witness, available to be cross-examined, as to its knowledge and as to any factual circumstances bearing on what reasonable diligence is required. 541. Lord Wolfson KC argues that any material, discovered, by Nigeria, after the 5th of December 2019, the date when the Section 68 challenge was issued, is necessarily irrelevant to Section 73 because, Self-evidently, Nigeria didn't need that additional material in order to raise its objection. That would be correct for a ground of objection raised at that point, understanding ground of objection in the way summarized in Balochistan, above, at points, 5 and, 6 at, 110, and at, 264, but not for a new ground of objection. This case, substance. 542. Nigeria says there are three answers to what it describes as P&ID's argument that, Nigeria, should, sick, with reasonable diligence have uncovered Mr. Quinn's perjury at the time of the arbitration, and is therefore barred by S. 73 of the 1996 Act. 543. The first answer given by Nigeria, is that members of Nigeria's legal team were corrupted, at the jurisdiction and liability stage, with the damage caused then already done by the quantum stage when it had a new legal team, although it points out that the original legal team remained in place for much of the quantum stage. In this judgment, I have rejected Nigeria's case that Mr. Shasor San and other members of Nigeria's legal team have been shown to have been corrupted. 544. 
The second of the three answers given by Nigeria, is that Takar establishes that it is not open to a party which has obtained, an arbitration, award by fraud to contend that the innocent party had acted unreasonably in failing to uncover the fraud. I have had to reject that argument, put as a jurisdictional limit, rather than as a conclusion on the facts of a case, in this judgment, by reference to the statute governing the position with regard to arbitration awards. 545. The third answer given by Nigeria, in the formulation used in its written closing, is that P and ID cannot maintain that, Nigeria, acted unreasonably in taking, Mr. Michael Quinn's evidence, at face value as a truthful piece of evidence, and not uncovering the perjury, in circumstances where that is precisely what P and ID's own legal team claims to have done, as did P and ID's experts. Lord Wolfson Casey's response is that Nigeria did not take Mr. Quinn's evidence at face value as truthful. 546. Lord Wolfson Casey summarized in his oral closing argument for P and ID that, all the matters which Nigeria relied on to bring its allegations that Mr. Quinn's evidence was perjured were not only reasonably discoverable, which would be enough, they were actually known and positively argued by Nigeria in the arbitration. But for all that might be said about Mr. Michael Quinn's knowingly false evidence as to finance, engineering, and expenditure, Lord Wolfson Casey's point does not hold for the bribery and its further concealment by Mr. Quinn in his evidence. 547. Whatever may be said about whether the possibility of dishonest evidence should be in the mind of a party who asserts a case which is, as Lord Wolfson Casey puts it in argument, flatly inconsistent with the evidence of an opposing party's witness, that situation is quite different to the situation where the opposing party's witness is further concealing bribery. It is the presence of the inconsistency that may start to prompt the discovery of fraud in the former case, but in the latter case, there is no equivalent until something happens to cause the concealment to start to break down. 548. In the opening argument, P and ID argued that on Mr. Malami San's own evidence for Nigeria, what P and ID termed six red flags were known by Nigeria upon or immediately after his appointment as Attorney General on the 11th of November 2015, with the first three of these being known throughout the arbitration proceedings. 549. The reason P and ID draws the distinction between the first three and the second three red flags is because, by the 11th of November 2015, the award on liability had been made. And as P and ID says, Nigeria would not have been able to keep to itself any discovery of fraud after the award on liability with the intention of using it only after the final award. 550. The red flags were developed and added to by P and ID in its closing. The purpose was to show that at least many of its points were derived from what Mr. Malami San suggested was suspicious. It is not necessary to deal with every suggested point individually, and it is also important not Mr. Malami San's suggestions as statements of what reasonable diligence is required. 551. P and ID helpfully gather S these points together in a summary as follows in its written closing. In August, 2012, Nigeria, was, on its own case, faced with a potential exposure of several billion dollars, under a deeply suspicious oil and gas contract, signed by the wrong minister, during a period of endemic corruption in Nigeria, and most particularly in the oil and gas sector, imposing an essentially unqualified obligation on, Nigeria, to supply gas to a BVI company which had no apparent assets, no industry experience, had carried out no work, had no engineering designs, had no finance, had no land. Had misrepresented that sufficient gas for the project would be available, and might reasonably have been suspected of having friends in government who would do its bidding. 552. In oral closing, Lord Wolfson Casey assembled the points from 2012 and before getting to 2015, in this way. What this means is that never mind during the arbitration, in August, 2012 on its own case, eight points we know were alive. First, Nigeria was being sued for $6 billion. Second, by a BVI company, 
something that we are told any Nigerian minister or official would know was in breach of Nigerian law. Third, with no apparent assets, experience or finance. Fourth, under a suspicious contract, to use Mr. Malami's phrase. Five, signed by the wrong minister. Six, at a time and in a sector when corruption was endemic. Seven, imposing an essentially unqualified obligation on Nigeria to supply gas. And eight, containing an unorthodox, according to Mr. Malami, an arbitration clause which breached Nigerian public policy. 553. P and ID's point about the size and importance of the claim is fair. Lord Wolfson submits that the potential exposure is important when assessing what amounts to reasonable diligence and I agree. But the point goes to effort rather than to indication of what needs to be looked at. 554. The first red flag coupled two parts. The first part was the contention that the GSBA was a contract which was, on its face, deeply suspicious. The second was the fact that the GSBA was entered into with a British Virgin Islands company with no apparent assets, no obvious industry experience, and no other credentials to suggest that it would be suitable to operate such a sophisticated arrangement, and where government business was generally conducted through a local Nigerian company. 555. As to the first part, P and ID does highlight Article 6A and B of the GSBA in particular although not alone. However, P and ID has itself shown the similarity of the GSBA with other contracts under the Advanced Gas Development Project, and C, 155, above. It is of note that, notwithstanding the points I have mentioned in this judgment, the GSBA did not strike the tribunal as, on its face, deeply suspicious. But I appreciate that part of P and ID's emphasis is that Mr. Malami, who was appointed in November 2015 and thus in the period of the arbitration, was saying it was suspicious to him. 556. As to the second part of the first red flag, Nigeria had had plenty of experience of working with ISIL group companies. The track record showed that ISIL group would bring experience and expertise in when needed, and Nigerian entities, including P and ID, Nigeria, were there if required. There is not enough in the first red flag to suggest bribery. 557. The second suggested red flag was the widespread presence of corruption in Nigeria, described by Mr. Malami San, including in the oil and gas industry and at the time the GSBA was entered into. This is not enough to suggest bribery in every individual case or in this case. 558. The third red flag was the failure to meet procurement procedures or authorization procedures. This is not a strong point in this case in the light of P and ID's emphasis on bureaucratic and procedural incompetence, and the position with other contracts under the Accelerated Gas Development Project. Mr. Malani informed the English court in December 2019 that certain authorization procedures were required by law with a view to, amongst other things, combating corruption. Again that is not enough to suggest bribery in every case in which they were not complied with or in this case. 559. The reference in the summary by P and ID to friends in government was to words used by Mr. Shasor San at the hearing on liability before the tribunal. The transcript of the hearing before the tribunal on liability shows that Mr. Shasor San also said that Mr. Quinn, in particular, felt they could get what they wanted because their friends in government would make it happen. As is fairly accepted in P and ID's closing argument these words are capable of a number of meanings. I do not consider it is reasonable to spell the beginnings of an allegation of bribery out of them, and there is no evidence that anyone who heard them did. 560. The reference in the summary by P and ID to its having carried out no work, had no engineering designs, had no finance, had no land, had misrepresented that sufficient gas for the project would be available refers to different subjects examined in this judgment. It is, by reference to my findings in this judgment, 
not accurate on some of the subjects but part of P and ID's point is that Nigeria saw these things in this way. But even then, I do not accept that these subjects and Nigeria's view of them required it, as a matter of reasonable diligence, to investigate for bribery. 561. But as we move to the fourth to sixth red flags, the emphasis includes reference to what inquiry the first three flags, or some of their elements, prompted. 562. The fourth and fifth red flags were in February 2016, when Stevenson Harwood advised an investigation by a credible investigations company into P&ID's history, its financial capabilities and general track record and Mr. Shasor-san advised Dr. Kakiku and Mrs. Adelor that FRN should be investigating the manner in which P&ID came to be selected to perform the GSBA in order to determine if there are any illegality or public policy reasons why it should not be awarded damages. In fact, there was the appointment of the FCC in February 2016 to investigate, and this found a number of things but not bribes. Part of P and ID's argument, pressed by Mr. Wolfson KC, is that given the points in its summary at, 551, or assembled at, 552, above, or the first three red flags, this all could have happened in 2012 rather than 2016. 563. But even 2016 is within the period of the arbitration, and thus relevant to Section 73. The FCC recommended in June 2016, Red Flag 6, after what it termed an interim investigation a further detailed investigation into the circumstances surrounding the award of the contract and the key parties to the transaction. That development does not in itself take things further in relation to bribes. P and ID points out that writing in February 2016 about its investigation, the FCC said it was investigating what it described as a case of conspiracy, abuse of office and misappropriation of public funds, but at that point that was not, I consider, doing the best I can with incomplete materials, an accurate description of what it was looking at, or what Stevenson Harwood or Mr. Shasor San had advised. 564. None of the points to which P and ID draws attention would have enabled an allegation of bribery to be raised or made in the present case or of the dishonesty in Mr. Quinn's witness statement in not referring to bribes. Nor, even if I take them together, do I consider that the points show that reasonable diligence required Nigeria to look for bribery in this case. There were many other things, specifically identified, to look into. Law Wolfson Casey in closing was strong in his criticism of Nigeria for not taking steps that were recommended, but what matters is whether reasonable diligence required Nigeria to look for bribery whilst dishonest evidence further concealed it. 565. P and ID contends that a reasonably diligent sovereign state would have put in issue during the arbitration the question of whether the GSBA, had been preceded by payments to Nigerian officials and whether it had been procured by corruption. That springboard, says P and ID, would have required Mr. Michael, Quinn's statement explicitly to address that point, and given, Nigeria, grounds for disclosure of relevant documents. P and ID also contends that a reasonably diligent sovereign state would have sought disclosure of documents relating to the GSBA. 566. But to put in issue during the arbitration the question of whether the GSBA had been preceded by payments to Nigerian officials and whether it had been procured by corruption, let alone seek an order in the arbitration for disclosure directed to that issue, would have required Nigeria to be aware of grounds for doing that. It did not have that awareness and Mr. Michael Quinn, Mr. Carhill, and P and ID were not going to reveal the truth. Indeed they were bribing or making corrupt payments to keep the truth concealed and, through retention of Nigeria's internal legal documents, monitoring Nigeria's awareness of the truth. 567. P and ID suggests that if an order for disclosure had been made in the arbitration there is no reason to believe that the documents disclosed in the initial round of disclosure in the present challenge under section 68 would not have been disclosed. These showed some reference to some pre-GSBA payments. 
Respectfully, even if a sufficient foundation for an order for disclosure could have been established in the arbitration, I do not accept that the documents suggested would have been disclosed. Throughout the arbitration P and ID was maintaining the false position originally represented by Mr. Michael Quinn on its behalf that what he had said in his witness statement explained how the GSBA came about. 568. P and ID adds still further steps that it says reasonable diligence would have involved. In doing so it again uses against Mr. Malami San that which he pressed in favor of Nigeria in 2019. P and ID does so by saying that reasonable diligence required the further steps to be taken earlier. The further steps include obtaining the P and ID case file from the Ministry of Petroleum Resources, looking into due diligence and procurement procedures, budgetary provision and operating license, asking other departments and oil and gas companies about Mr. Quinn and P and ID, and exploring the roles of Dr. Luckman, Mr. A. Jimagobia, Mrs. Grace Tiger, and Mr. Tijani. In the case of Mrs. Grace Tiger, this was because she witnessed the GSBA and public procurement procedures had not been followed. 569. But the reasonable diligence with which I am concerned is confined to reasonable diligence that would have discovered the grounds for the objection, that is of the award being obtained by fraud or the award or the way in which it was procured being contrary to public policy because of bribery or corrupt payments, because of false evidence in connection with them, and because of what happened with Nigeria's internal legal documents. Nothing in my judgment began that path until after the arbitration, and indeed until Nigeria first began to acquire knowledge of the bribery of Mrs. Grace Tiger, and that P and ID had Nigeria's internal legal documents. 570. Nigeria first began to acquire knowledge of the bribery of Mrs. Grace Tiger when she was interviewed by and gave a statement to EFCC in September 2019. I do not accept that reasonable diligence required an interview capable of extending to bribery or corrupt payments at any earlier point. I am also unpersuaded that an interview with Miss Tiger before 2019 would have revealed then what was revealed by her statement in 2019. And even then her statement, did not reveal the first bribe at the time of the GSBA, for that Nigeria had to go to the New York court. 571. P and ID says that had Mr. Malami directed the EFCC to obtain Mrs. Grace Tiger's bank statements that they would have been produced in a matter of days, as happened when he eventually sought them in 2019. But the starting point is a basis that makes that step reasonable, and that was not, in my judgment, before 2019. 572. Nigeria first began to acquire knowledge that P and ID had Nigeria's internal legal documents on the 29th of October 2021 when that was disclosed to it by Cobre and Kim. It knew nothing about what was going on in relation to those documents before then, and reasonable diligence required nothing from Nigeria in that connection. 573. Under Section 73, Nigeria has shown me that, at the time it took part or continued to take part in the arbitration, it did not know and could not with reasonable diligence have discovered the grounds for its objection under Section 68 2G. Accordingly, it did not lose its right to object under Section 68 2G. Conclusion? 574. In the circumstances and for the reasons I have sought to describe and explain, Nigeria succeeds on its challenge under Section 68. I have not accepted all of Nigeria's allegations. But the awards were obtained by fraud and the awards were and the way in which they were procured was contrary to public policy. 575. What happened in this case is very serious indeed, and it is important that Section 68 has been available to maintain the rule of law. 576. Section 68, 3, provides. 3. If there is shown to be serious irregularity affecting the tribunal, the proceedings, or the award, the court may. a. Remit the award to the tribunal, in whole or in part, for reconsideration. v. Set the award aside in whole or in part, or c. Declare the award to be of no effect, 
in whole or in part. The court shall not exercise its power to set aside or to declare an award to be of no effect, in whole or in part, unless it is satisfied that it would be inappropriate to remit the matters in question to the tribunal for reconsideration. 577. I was asked by Lord Wolfson Casey in closing that should my judgment conclude in favor of Nigeria, as it does, to leave over the question of the order the court should make so that the parties have the opportunity to present an argument once they have considered the judgment. I respect that request and will hear that argument as soon as that can be arranged. Reflecting on the agreement, the GSBA, the arbitration and the awards. 578. The GSBA, had said that its objective was to provide for the construction of gas processing facilities by P and ID encompassing the provision of wet gas by the government and the processing of the said wet gas by P and ID utilizing two or more process streams with a total capacity of up to 400 muscuf together with all utilities, support and maintenance facilities at the site, and the provision of lean gas by P and ID. To the government as set forth in this agreement and its appendices and to operate and maintain the facilities in an efficient manner. 579. Stripped of repetition the GSBA as a whole provided for little more detail. A schedule of works was said to be annexed at Appendix B even if a schedule was annexed, it could have added little because the main work that had been done was not for that particular site or that particular project. 580. In the arbitration the tribunal did what it did with what it had. The English court too saw nothing of what truly lay underneath when it first, briefly, came across the arbitration in 2016. But the fact is that the arbitration was a shell that got nowhere near the truth. 581. Policy, worldwide, properly limits challenges to arbitration awards. In the present case a challenge has been available and, in my judgment, has prevailed. But I end the case acutely conscious of how readily the outcome could have been different, and of the enormous resources ultimately required from Nigeria, as the successful party to make good its challenge. I highlight the possible consequences if Mr. Andrew had drafted Mr. Michael Quinn's witness statement a little more cautiously and if P&ID had not retained Nigeria's internal legal documents during the arbitration. 582. Regardless of my decision, I hope the facts and circumstances of this case may provoke debate and reflection among the arbitration community, and also among state users of arbitration, and among other courts with the responsibility to supervise or oversee arbitration. The facts and circumstances of this case, which are remarkable but very real, provide an opportunity to consider whether the arbitration process, which is of outstanding importance and value in the world, needs further attention where the value involved is so large and where a state is involved. 583. The risk is that arbitration as a process becomes less reliable, less able to find difficult but important new legal ground, and more vulnerable to fraud. The present case shows that having, as here, a tribunal of the greatest experience and expertise is not enough. Without reflection, then a case such as the present could happen again, and not reach the court. 584. With diffidence and respect, I draw attention to four points, which are to some degree interconnected. 1. Drafting major commercial contracts involving a state. 585. It was a complete imbalance in the contributions of the parties that enabled the GSBA to be in the form it was. Many reading this judgment will recognize that, although in the present case, bribery and corruption were behind that imbalance, it happens in other cases without bribery and corruption but simply where experience, expertise or resources are grossly unequal. This underlines the importance of professional standards and ethics in the work of contract drafting, including in the approach to other parties to the proposed contract. It is why some contributions of pro bono work by leading law firms to support some states challenged for resources, this is not to say, one way or the other, that Nigeria is one of those, is so valuable, in the interests of their, often vulnerable, people. In the present case, there were other contracts too, 
with different counterparties. Their terms and circumstances are not identical, but the overall risk could have been a multiple of the 11 billion US dollars now involved in the present case. 2. Disclosure or discovery of documents. 586. It has been the disclosure or discovery of documents that has enabled the truth to be reached in this case. I highlight the disclosure orders made by courts in this and other jurisdictions. The disclosure secured from P and ID and third parties through court processes has been remarkable and crucial. And but for disclosure orders, the Sunrise episode would not have been revealed from Nigeria. In all the recent debates about where disclosure or discovery matters, this case stands a strong example for the answer that it does. 3. Participation and representation in arbitrations over major disputes involving a state. 587. Notwithstanding Nigeria's allegations, I have not found Nigeria's lawyers in the arbitration to be corrupt. But the case has shown examples where legal representatives did not do their work to the standard needed, where experts failed to do their work, and where politicians and civil servants failed to ensure that Nigeria as a state participated properly in the arbitration. The result was that the tribunal did not have the assistance that it was entitled to expect, and which makes the arbitration process work. And Nigeria did not in the event properly consider, select, and attempt admittedly difficult legal and factual arguments that the circumstances likely required. Even without the dishonest behavior of P and ID, Nigeria was compromised. 588. But what is an arbitral tribunal to do? The tribunal in the present case allowed time where it felt it could and applied pressure where it felt it should. Perhaps some encouragement to better engagement can be seen as well. Yet there was not a fair fight. And the tribunal took a very traditional approach. But was the tribunal stuck with what parties did or did not appear to bring forward? Could and should the tribunal have been more direct and interventionist when it was so clear throughout the arbitration that Nigeria's lawyers were not getting instructions, or when at the quantum hearing Nigeria's then leading counsel, Chief Erend, was failing to put necessary points to experts to test their opinion and Nigeria's own experts, for whatever reason, had not done the work required? Should the tribunal have taken the initiative to encourage exploration of new bounds of contract law and the law of damages that may today be required where major long-term contracts are involved? 4. Confidentiality in significant arbitrations involving a state. 589. The privacy of arbitration meant that there was no public or press scrutiny of what was going on and what was not being done. When courts are concerned it is often said that the open court principle helps keep judges up to the mark. But it also allows scrutiny of the process as a whole, and what the lawyers and other professionals are doing, and, where a state is involved, what the state is doing to address a dispute on behalf of its people. An open process allows the chance for the public and press to call out what is not right. 590. To take another example, I have concluded that when the parties entered into the GSBA, P and ID's intention was to perform and not simply use the GSBA as a device to get an award or settlement. But the case shows the danger of the latter happening. The situation was serious enough to cause Nigeria to allege that Mr. Shasor San's efforts were those of a leading counsel deliberately underperforming. I have found against the allegation in this case, but it was one responsibly made by Mr. Howard Casey, and with his fully appreciating the professional responsibilities on him in making that allegation. 591. And Lord Wolfson Casey will forgive my quoting his submission for his client in oral closing argument, section 68 is not there to give you a remedy if you instruct an honest lawyer who makes a mess of it or doesn't take an available point. That is just tough. You have made your arbitration bed and you lie on it. Blunt, and correct. But, unless accompanied by public visibility or greater scrutiny by arbitrators, how suitable is the process in a case such as this where what is at stake is public money amounting to a material percentage of a state's GDP or budget? 
Is greater visibility in arbitrations involving a state or state-owned entities part of the answer? End note. 592. This case has also, sadly, brought together a combination of examples of what some individuals will do for money. Driven by greed and prepared to use corruption, giving no thought to what their enrichment would mean in terms of harm for others. Others that in the present case include the people of Nigeria, already let down in so many ways over the history of this matter by a number of individuals in politics and administration whose duty it was to serve them and protect them. 593. I will be referring a copy of this judgment to the Bar Standards Board in the case of Mr. Trevor Burke KC and to both the Solicitor's Regulation Authority and the Bar Standards Board in the case of Mr. Seamus Andrew. I trust that these two regulators of the legal profession in England and Wales will consider the professional consequences of the conduct of Mr. Burke KC and Mr. Andrew in relation to Nigeria's internal legal documents. As a separate matter, Although there was an argument before me about the acceptability of the remuneration arrangements for Mr. Burke KC, that would be a satellite point for the issues I have the responsibility to decide and is best left for the regulator for whom it will be a central point. 594. Against the deeply unhappy matters to which I have referred in the last two paragraphs, I am pleased to record that the trial was fought and presented on both sides to the highest professional standards. The expertise and tenacity shown by Mishkon Dereya and Nigeria's team of counsel, Mr. Howard Casey, Mr. Riches Casey, Mr. Ford, Mr. Pasco, and Mr. Malab, has made the difference in getting to the facts, although some allegations were not made out. But I wish to mention in particular Quinn Emanuel and P. and I.D.'s team of counsel, Lord Wolfson Casey, Mr. Milner Casey, Mr. Hoskins, and Mr. Evans. Their professionalism in ensuring that all points were properly and responsibly taken for their client in a difficult case, whilst at the same time ensuring both at and in advance of the trial that their duties to the court, especially as regards their client's disclosure of documents, were assiduously honoured, has my respect and profoundly deserves that of their client. 595. And so to the last point. Sir Ross Cranston has recently heard his last case in the High Court of England and Wales, although he remains fully involved in the legal system, here and overseas, in other significant roles. The facts and argument presented across the eight-week trial before me were in material respects different and of course far more developed from those put before Sir Ross at the interim hearing in July 2020. But that makes his decision and written judgment on that interim hearing the more impressive still for the acuity, independence, and courage involved. Without that decision and judgment, an injustice would have remained, the population of an entire federation of states would have suffered from the economic consequences, and fundamental damage would have been left to the integrity of arbitration as a process. This podcast was brought to you by BG Media App and BarGlobal.net. Please subscribe, like, and share this video, it does help support our productions. Also, please download the BG Media app to access the best works of the world's authors rendered in audiobooks, along with great experience through music, podcasts, and vodcasts. Mm -hmm.